go to the next speaker, who is Joshua Van Marevic. And we are switching from AGBs to Galaxy Cluster. Uh, Galaxy Cluster, the Redshift 2, seen with Alma and the Nair Sedlovich effect. So, Joshua, please. Cool. Can you see my slides with my mouse? Yes, very good. Okay, amazing. Yeah, I realized my title was a bit long, so I shorted it a little bit. So we're going to talk about today uh, about high rates of galaxy clusters, and I'm going to use XLSSC 122 as a case study. So I'm Yoshiva van Marwijk. I'm a second year PhD student at ESO, uh, supervised by Tony Moskowski and Gergo Popping. And I work a lot with Luca Di Moscolo too in the ACT collaboration. And a lot of the analysis um, and actually, physics is very similar to the talk given by Vanessa Fran. So if you missed that, I definitely recommend watching that. But before we go into details, I think we should uh, start easy. And I just want to explain to you my excitement about high redshift galaxy clusters and why I think you should study it too, or at least uh, why it's there in, in the field in general. So just to start with, clusters are simply fascinating. There are the environments in which galaxies evolve in, uh, see, for instance, band pressure stripping. But I think more interesting is actually the matter which is in between the galaxies, uh, where also most of the baryonic mass is. So you have this hot plasma uh, of ionized gas uh, heated up by the gravity of uh, gravitational potential set by the dark matter. And you can see these amazing, for instance, shock fronts or slush emotions in galaxy clusters. Uh, and especially at high redshifts, the time since the Big Bang become limited. For me, redshift, high redshift is redshift one to two for the people who use James Webb here, because it takes a long time to form these clusters. But if you go to high redshift galaxy clusters, there's a limited amount of time to form these structures. So you can really test the formation of these mega size, mega parsec size uh, structures. And this also immediately enables a new probe for cosmology too. So those clusters have been used throughout cosmology uh, as to measure the baryonic density of the universe. But if you go to higher and higher redshifts, the formation time becomes limited, and you can therefore use them as a probe for G2, very similar to the cases uh, which makes the first galaxies a very high topic at this moment. And then finally, uh, doing galaxy cluster science is a very hot topic at the moment. A lot of new absurdities are coming online, for instance, Toltec, but also Euclid, and James Webb will get uh, weak lensing measurements and will find protoclusters throughout the field at higher and higher redshifts. But also Simon's Observatory, the and CEB experiment, which is coming online next year, which are expected to find thousands of clusters above a redshift of one, which is really, really exciting. Okay, um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, the observable we want to exploit uh, to detect the actual clusters in the submillimeters to show the other feature effect. So I'm aware that in the ALMA community, a lot of people, when they talk about galaxy cluster, focus a lot on the cluster members, which is these little, little dots here. But I want to talk about this diffuse extended emission, right? This hot intercluster medium, this plasma in between the galaxies. So to show you the other feature, uh, as Vanessa also explained, you have cosmic microwave backgrounds. They have these hot electrons. They scatter the photons and they do inverse Compton scattering. So they change the frequency. So when you expect to see the cosmic microwave backgrounds, you don't see it because the frequencies are upscattered at uh, 90 gigahertz. So you see this negative surface brightness, this lack of CMD photos, as for instance illustrated here in blue. So that's the observable we want to exploit. And uh, single dish telescopes have already exploited this observable uh, for a decade and found thousands and thousands of clusters. So here uh, is, for instance, an overview of their catalog. On the y-axis, I show their cluster mass, and on the x-axis, their redshift. And these are the two most fundamental parameters uh, to do cosmology with, with these clusters. If you zoom in on, on the data uh, by these single dish telescopes, for instance, ACT, uh, and I want to use XLSC here as an example, all these clusters are just single blobs, right? The beam is at one arc minute, and all the magic is actually hidden here within a single beam. And what we want to know, especially at high redshift, is these clusters are still forming or not? How do they look like? Are they asymmetries, etc.? So we want to have high resolution observation to actually see what's going on within this single blob as seen by most of the uh, single dish telescopes. So, how to quantify this, what people usually do is when they get high resolution images, they try to find the best fit pressure profile. So the Schneider's other feature measures the integrated pressure along the line of sight. So this is the fundamental parameter you model mostly. And you can see here six lines or six profiles that uh, encapsulates three different types at two different redshifts. So you have cool cores, which have a very big central uh, pressure profile, which take, which are sort of relaxed clusters and much more 
take much more time to uh, to form, and you have the more disturbed one, which are post merging or they are flatten out distributions. So if this is the post merging one, this is a cool core, and then you have the average. And there are some people who believe that these pressure profiles should evolve as redshift. So if you go to higher redshift, if you go to the yellow lines here. So what we want to see, for instance, is how XLSS, uh, so the cluster I'm going to look at at redshift two, falls on top of this diagram. And for that, obviously, we're going to use Alma. Alma uh, 90 gigahertz, Alma Band 3 to add resolution to the single dish telescope. So here, I already show you the image. So let's focus here on the left. This is the dirty uh, image of Alma, but also with ACA Band 3 observations. And we want to model the pressure profile. Uh, we do this in the visibility plane, and we'll go into more detail there. And you can really see the residuals here. So a single pressure profile uh, uh, projected on a 2D plane, uh, introducing some elliptici can describe the data very well. But this is the cluster we're looking at, right? So you can see the decrement here in blue. Uh, you can see some uh, negative surface brightness, and then this red circle around it, which is the dirty beam pattern. So now let's go into detail how we do the modeling. So if you want to model extended emission with Alma, uh, you're very much affected by the filtering of the interferometer. So if you go to the visibility plane, this is your UV coverage. Every data point here has an amplitude, which has a real part and an imaginary part. You can see that you're missing zero point information, which filters out the flux at large scales. So if you want to retrieve um, larger scales, you actually should go back to the visibility plane as it favors the retrieval of the extended emission. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize this in a 1D projection. So you make radial bins, which you calculate the distance from the center of each data point, and then plot the amplitude within this radial bin. So like I said, every data point has an imaginary imaginary part and a real part. And then you have your UV distance, your baseline. So smaller UV distances is larger scales, and larger UV distances is smaller scales. So if you have to see how Zelda feature a negative extended emission, you expect uh, flux, negative flux at the smaller UV distances and zero flux at the larger UV distances. And this is how a model looks like, right? This is a spherically symmetric model. Uh, we use generalized NFW profiles, just like Vanessa. But uh, the one thing you can already see is if you introduce elasticity, you widen up the, the, the width of your model because you make radial bins and you start making radial bins at larger radii. If you have an elliptical profile and you make a radial average, you're going to have scatter in your radial bin. And this scatter here is now visualized by this uh, shaded area. So what we do is we then do a nested sampling routine. Uh, this is a forward modeling routine, in which you, optimize on, you try to find the posterior distribution of your parameters, which uh, describe your pressure profile, so your generalized NFW. Um, and I can also plot here the data of XLSSC. And you can clearly see that we recovered this extended emission here. And it looks, I think it looks beautiful. But the problem is if you want to classify XLSC based on the pressure profiles I've seen before, and you want to fit for the amplitude, the position, and the elasticity, it becomes very hard to distinguish different pressure profiles. So these are the six lines I've shown before. Uh, and here we model for amplitude, the centroid, and the elasticity. And we keep the shape parameters of the pressure profile similar. So um, what this means, you can also see this in the image plane, that it becomes very hard to classify high redshift uh, uh, galaxy clusters just because you miss the information here at the smallest baselines or the larger scales. And in the image plane variants, when we go back to the pressure profiles, you can see if you don't know the amplitude, all these lines, except for this local cool core profile, start to overlap. So you cannot distinguish uh, between the different, the different classifications, which is a bummer, but there are ways to go forward, right? What we can do is we can join forces. If we jointly model uh, not only interferometric observations, but we combine them with single dish data, we can get uh, a total flux uh, from the single dish and we get the resolution from all my ACA. There's a little bit of a problem here because the CMB introduces crosstalk between uh, single dish telescopes and Alma and ACA. So it took a long while to figure this out. And Jay Gill, who's uh, in Toronto, helped a lot with the frequency map modeling of ACT. But just to give you an illustration here, if you add single dish data, you add an extra constraint on the total integrated flux, which is shown here, or you add a data point here in the visibility plane. And for now, we've done some tests. You can see that we've got better constraints on the amplitude now, but the effects that adding the single dish has on constraining the shape parameters of the pressure profile is still unknown, and we're still working on this. So this is to be continued. You will probably see it when you 
sumo paper at some point arrive at the archive, I hope. Uh, but to go back to the modeling. So this is where I started with. Uh, this is the Alman HCA image, the dirty beam image. This is our model. Uh, so the way we make the model uh, is we try to account for the degeneracies in the posterior distribution. So because we do nested sampling or an M it's very similar to an MCMC, you can get every uh, sample of your posterior distribution and make an image out of it. Um, if you do that, you can weigh each image by their likelihood and then average. So you get a likelihood average model reconstruction. That's what this image shows you here. So this image then is also corrected for the UV coverage of the online ACA observations. And then if you see in the residuals, you can see that the central part of this cluster is gone and most of the side lobes are also gone. The only thing is that if you add high resolution observation to this interesting astrophysical phenomena for galaxy cluster, it's kind of boring just to average out to the single pressure profile, right? So you wanna have more interesting physics going on. And those interesting physics should be hidden here in the residuals. And you can see already this like three and a half sigma blob here and here, but three and a half sigma blobs in the image plane with all my eyes, very uncertain if it's real or not. So we've done the following. We've tried to make a cleaned image of our ALMA, but using extended emission. So instead of correcting this model here uh, by the UV coverage, uh, we just get our infinitely smooth uh, pressure distribution, then convolve it with the synthesized beam, similar to how clean operates, and then add it back with the residuals to get a cleaned image reconstruction of extended emission. And this is how the image looks like. So we get a galaxy cluster here in the center, and then we have this asymmetries here in the south. Now, the question is, uh, so I also show cluster members here with the little circles, but uh, the question is, is this asymmetric features here in the south, so the contours are drawn on minus two, uh, are those real or not? And are these, are these like filamentary structures or an infalling group? So what we've done, instead of modeling by a single component, so a single pressure profile, we add a, a second one and do the whole forward modeling routine again. And this is what we find. So in black, I show the contours uh, of the smooth model and we can find this additional peak here. So more or less, uh, if you don't find an additional component, you would just uh, see that two pressure peaks fall on top of each other and you get a singular beam. But now we see that we have um, the bulk of the intercluster medium is captured by this larger model and there's a small side lobe thing. Now, not, not, it's not a side lobe thing, it's a small asymmetric feature here. And because we do nested sampling, we can have access to the Bayesian evidence and we find a Bayesian evidence difference of 6.6. .6. So that means that uh, the data favors a two component model over a single component model by roughly uh, four sigma. So I think that's really cool. We did a full Bayesian analysis and actually we found asymmetric features here in the pressure distribution of the intercluster medium. And uh, it's, it's, if you look at the amplitude ratio, the amplitude of the bulk of the intercluster medium is roughly seven times as high as uh, the minor component here. So we see that this is a, a smaller creating filament or a smaller infalling group. So it's a minor merger, which we can resolve out with all my ACA. But then to understand the physics, which is going on, uh, we need to uh, broaden our wavelength horizon in some way or another. So we need to go beyond the sub-millimeter. So this is the optical. Uh, there was a paper by Willis et al. in 2020 that uh, actually detected 37 cluster members of this case cluster already at Redshift 2. Uh, and now if we overplot here, the signal is the feature. So I, I played around a little bit with the fluffiness. You can already see that it's sort of more extended here in the south, but there are some correlation with cluster members too. But I think more interesting is to combine a C observation with X-ray. So there's been a bunch of genre and XMM data but uh, now you need to be aware of the different physics that produces X-ray imaging and Schnauzelderfeet imaging. So Schnauzelderfeet measures the integrated pressure, which is linear with density of the hot gas, while the X-ray emission here covers uh, bram styling emission, which is proportional to the density squared. So the Schnauzelderfeet, even though it's, it's also redshift independent surface brightness, it also can probe lower density gas. Oh, sorry, sorry, you still have maybe one or two minutes. Okay, cool. So we probe lower density gas. So the re it's like the whole uh, reason we don't detect any X-ray photons here, there are not many photons to work with to begin with, but we don't detect any here, uh, gives us the impression we're having a low, low density gas uh, accreting to this uh, cluster already. And uh, the BCG, which is shown here in optical and it's expected on top of the X-ray contours is offset from the bulk of the pressure distribution, meaning that this cluster is still actively forming. Uh, so to summarize, 
we started with a single blob from ACA, from uh, the act observations, no uh, circular symmetric, uh, just everything with all the beam. And we added ACA and ALMA to, to see the magic which is happening underneath the hood. Too bad that we couldn't yet constrain the pressure profiles based on ACA and ALMA alone because of the filtering and the missive flux problem. Uh, but we do find from the imaging and the modeling that uh, there are two components. So as this work is still in process, uh, we're still some things to do. So we want to see how this BCG is forming. And I think the intercluster light can tell us something there. Also, we want to know what the entropy of the gas is doing. So if you combine X-ray uh, density measurements and pressure measurements, you can get an entropy. So you can see if the cluster, if the BCG is forming by precipitation or by forming wet mergers. The thing more importantly is we want to know what the cluster mass is doing. Um, you can't use scaling relations from local observations, so you can use dynamical modeling from the cluster members, but I think more interesting is that James Webb can do weak lensing up to Redshift 2, uh, or maybe even in the future we can lens the scene. I just want to wrap it up with this slide. So I know I've been talking just about one source, but I think what we should do is we utilize ALMA in the best way and use it as a follow-up instrument from ACT. So what we can do, for instance, is we can follow up all high Redshift ACT clusters above a Redshift of 1.3, because then you have simultaneously access to the larger scales and CO120 in all my band ones. I think that could be very, very exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. A nice talk. So we already have a joke or comment from Abhijit. Abhijit, you want to say it? Or is it a question about the redshift? Is it like one uh, redshift one or two? Is it already still high redshift or any longer yeah. because of the GWS GW, ah, GWST data? So I work with both. So I work with Richard 13 and 2. <laughs> but if you define it in a way how much time it takes to form a cluster, like if you form a galaxy of like a kiloparsec, you don't need that much time. But if you want to form a galaxy cluster of a megaparsec, it takes much, much longer. So I think if you define it that way, Redshift 2 is actually really, really high. And if you compare it with radio observations from SKO, they don't go to higher to Redshift 1 or 0 0.5. So Redshift 2 is actually really, really high. Fair comment. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> So do we have more questions? I do have one in the meantime. So you maybe see some uh, asymmetry or some uh, filaments. Uh, is there any clusters? Or are there any other clusters where these kind of asymmetries have been observed before? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. There are these classifications in clusters which call them relaxed and disturbed. But if you start to look at every cluster, they're almost all all in some way or another disturbed. So the brightest ones, uh, and this is definitely the brightest of this redshift, are super asymmetric, uh, such as, for instance, El Gordo or the Bulu cluster. So yeah, they're definitely being observed before. Also so you, with ALMA. Yeah. You, you already know that your initial assumption that the, the cluster will be circular is uh, just the starting one, right? You're not really prepared. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it seems we have one more question from... Uh... Monica? Yeah, if I have time. So I really like your approach. Very nice results. I'm wondering, since you are acquiring ALMA data for CO lines, do you plan to do like kinematics, dynamic studies as well for the filaments, the structure wise correlation, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so we detect a little bit of cluster members too, but this is still something we need to explore. But I think it's the, having ALMA having access to both the cold molecular gas in these clusters and also the hot intercluster medium is amazing. You can do a lot of correlation studies there. And especially if you want to combine it with uh, dynamical studies. But I think if you want to go to higher redshift, it's 0, 1 to 0. I think the arc you want to do compact configuration, the resolution is going to be like arc, eight arc seconds. So that might be tough to do like real dynamical, like velocity modeling of the cluster. Is that what you went for or did you mean something yeah, else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 okay. no. That's yeah. that's what I meant. But that that will be super cool to compare multi-phase. So looking forward to yeah. it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Good. Maybe time for one more question. Quick. Anything from a stack or? No, there are no more questions. Okay. Then, if no more question, and thank you again very much for this cool. interesting talk.